Turn your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 4. I guess we're going to start in verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Enmity is hatred. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Well, let's break this down. Where comes all these wars and fighting? It's because of our lusts. Lust is not necessarily always sexual. Um, people, politicians, uh, lust power. They love to be in charge of other people's lives. I have seen that in so many managers that I've worked for in companies. They just loved making, having the power to be able to make other li people's lives miserable. I mean, I've seen it for no other reason. And it says, ye lust. You know, it could, it could just as easily say desire, I suppose. I mean, I'm not trying to rewrite the Bible. King James translators knew a lot more than I ever will. But it says, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Do you know, there are countries, like, like in Haiti. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Perhaps you've heard of some of the things from Haiti. It's where zombies come from, the idea of zombies, and voodoo. Voodoo comes from Haiti. I mean, it was like 30 years ago when I was learning about a little bit about voodoo, not, not to practice it, just, you know, I live down here in South Florida and it's very prevalent down here. And, uh, I mean, it was, and zombies, nobody had ever heard of that stuff, almost except for maybe like in New Orleans, which is heavily into um, vampirism. But Haiti, the gospel of Jesus Christ, there has been so many people, so many different ministries that have gone to Haiti and preached the gospel. And you may as well be preaching to a graveyard with nobody there but dead people, six foot underground. The gospel does not take in Haiti. They prefer voodoo. That is what they want. Why are they so poor? The Bible says, ye have not because ye ask amiss. Ye, oh, I'm sorry. Yet ye have not because ye ask amiss not. They don't ask Jesus, who is Christ, for their daily bread. They don't do that. When you go to India, they have, I have heard, they have over 100,000 different gods. Perhaps you've heard of Hare Krishna, that's one. Shiva, the destroyer. There's a statue of Shiva, the destroyer, in the front entrance to CERN that was given to them 
Perhaps you've heard of CERN, the Collider. Shiva the Destroyer, a statue that was made in India, one of their gods, placed at the entrance of CERN. Isn't that interesting? And Brahma, you've got Vishnu, and you've got basically hundreds of thousands of different gods in India. India is another one of those poor, poor countries. Why are they so poor? They don't ask Jesus for their daily bread. They don't give glory to him and God, the Father. No. They ask Shiva, the destroyer, or Hare Krishna, or Brahma, or Vishnu. Shiva, you know, you think you're going to get anything by asking the devil for something? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And then it says, verse 3, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. In other words, you, they ask and they don't receive because they're asking amiss. They're asking wrongly. When you ask the uh, like the um, the charismatics, what do they ask for? They ask for material blessings. Remember the old Janis Joplin song? Oh Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? Yeah. How about asking for understanding of the Word of God when you read it? The Bible says, Seek ye first. Well, in Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're the first seek, we're the first to look for, first thing we're supposed to do is seek out, look for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ. You're not going to have righteousness by keeping the Torah. I mean, it's, you know, we shouldn't murder people. We shouldn't worship idols. And... You know, I personally, I think resting on the Sabbath and reflecting upon the things that God has done in our lives and studying the scriptures, um, I personally think that's a good thing. But if you think that by abstaining from working on the Sabbath is going to make you righteous, no, 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 no. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ. And all these things shall be added unto you. You see, these people that ask for material wealth, they're asking amiss. They're asking wrong. You know, Abraham was rich. Why? Because he always put God first. God knew he put him first. I mean, he would have sacrificed his son Isaac. He was going to do it. But God stayed his hand. Abraham was very wealthy because God knew that Abraham would never put his wealth before the Lord. You know, think about that. The Charismatics... That they want the things of this world. And verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think the scripture saith in vain that spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? In other words, are you envious of your neighbor that's got a Mercedes Benz that lives in a, you know, really nice house and, you know, 
Verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, draw near to him, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. That's what Christians should be doing for America today with all the witchcraft, all the garbage Harry Potter and, and, and all the sin, the abortions, the horrible, the, the children that are being raped by these powerful men and politicians. The news media even calls all this Pizzagate stuff as fake news. This, these, what is it, Department of Child Services, DCS, or whatever they call it, DCF, whatever they call it by different names in different states. They kidnap children from parents. And they're now placing these children, they're letting sodomites adopt boys. There was a bo young boy in Australia that was raped to death by a pair of sodomites. And do you know Australia passed a law that if you point out that these two sodomites that raped this boy to, young boy to death in their adoption, they, the state of Australia let these two sodomites adopt this boy and they raped him to death. And if you point this out, it's a hate crime. You can go to jail. I mean, this is the kind of sick perversion. And it's not just Australia. It's, it's Europe. It's America. James says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to hum heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. It says, speak not evil of one another, brethren. Are sodomites that rape five-year-old boys to death, brethren? No, they're not. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver, and that's Christ. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgeth another? Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this and or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Hmm. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Why are there wars? Because we desire to have other people's things. And we don't ask rightly. Let me let you in on a little thing. In the communist revolution in Russia, the people that call themselves by the same title, 
who killed Jesus and the Christians in the Bible were the same people that call themselves the same words. They destroyed the Christian church in Russia, murdered them. I mean, I'm thinking, my estimate was probably about 65 million. And that's a conservative estimate. Well, guess what? The Christians were the farmers. And they were wiped out. So what happened? Um, they had a famine. Yeah. And there was bad weather. You see, you think you're going to wipe out God's children and God's going to bless you? Uh, no. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, in 78 B, the Jews who generally rejected Jesus Christ in his words rebelled against Rome. They wanted to bring in the kingdom just like they want to do now. They want to rebuild their temple and what have you. Redo animal sacrifice. I guess the blood of Jesus just isn't good enough for the Jews. So the Jews in 70 AD rebelled against Rome. And the Roman armies came, the legions. I heard there was two or three legions, which is about 15% of the entire Roman army. You're talking the Roman army that had conquered most of the known world. And they surrounded Jerusalem. In Matthew 24, Jesus said that, um, well, let's read it. I'm not going to paraphrase. I'm going to read it. Now, if you want to, you can read Luke 21. It's a parallel account of Matthew 24. But basically, the disciples asked Jesus what it was going to be like toward the end. So let's start in Luke 21 and verse 12. Um, so he was warning, basically, no, let's do 11. Uh, Luke 21, 11. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences. Well, there was famine in communist Russia. Bad weather, and they murdered all the farmers, and you know what? Haiti did the same thing. They murdered all the white farmers. And guess what? Famine. That's usually what happens when you are stupid enough to kill all your farmers. And then, of course, when you kill all your Christian farmers, well, God sends them no rain. Then you're hit with a double whammy. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places and famines and pestilences. That's disease. And let me tell you something. When people don't have enough to eat, they get disease, diseases. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, delivering you up to the synagogues, who hangs out in the synagogues? Not Christians. No. To Judaism, Christianity is a heresy punishable by death. Don't believe me? Check it out. Delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Yes, 
God the Father is going to, I mean, and Christ is going to give you the Holy Spirit that's going to speak through you. Verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And what name is it that they hate above all names? Jesus. They hate that name so much that they want to change it to Yeshua. And to a Jew, Yeshua could be Rabbi Menachem Schneerson or Rabbi Kaduri, or any number of rabbis. Some of those rabbis that practice what is called the Kabbalah. You know, you see those little celebrities on TV and, and what have you with their little red strings. They practice what's called Kabbalah. And there's a lot of rabbis that practice that stuff. There's a lot of Jews that call them Yeshua. So when you hear Yeshua, it's not necessarily speaking about Jesus. So, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Yeah, hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And, here's the, here's the linchpin. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. What does compassed mean? It means surrounded. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Ooh. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you should know that the desolation is very close, right? Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. See, Christ was warning his, his sheep. When you saw Jerusalem surrounded with armies, you know the jig is up. Run to the mountains. Flee. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. In other words, if you're in the country, don't be going to Jerusalem. Bad idea. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them, that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath, and wrath upon this people. Why was there wrath? Because they rejected God the Father's only begotten Son. In the book of John, chapter 3 and verse 36, He that believeth on the Son... Who's the Son? Jesus, who is the Christ. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Oh, yeah. Huh. Let's go back to verse Luke 21, verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Yes, there were people that accepted Christ, but the great majority did not. Therefore there was wrath upon them. Verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be 
fulfilled. Well, let me tell you what. In 70 AD, the Roman legions, the army came and surrounded Jerusalem. And for some reason, they withdrew. And the, the Christians that believe the words of Jesus, they said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, compassed about with armies, flee to the mountains. They grabbed what they could carry and they left Jerusalem. The Christians who believed the words of Jesus left their homes behind. Well, guess what? It wasn't long afterwards that they had left. They would fled to the mountains. The Roman legion surrounded Jerusalem again. And the Jews that had rebelled against Rome, Masada, check that out. They were slaughtered. I have read accounts that up to a million Jews were exterminated by the Roman legions. The Masada was a very high plateau up on the, uh, like, a flat part of a mountain where they'd build, I believe Herod had built a, um, like a, like a castle-like thing. What the Roman army do? They took rocks and they built a ramp up to Masada. And they took everything that they needed to destroy it up the ramp. Well, it took them a while to do it. Their engineers built a ramp right up to the top of the mountain, up to the plateau, and they wiped them out. And wrath upon this people. Why? Because they rejected God the Son. John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So in communist Russia, they killed all the Christian farmers, had no rain, their crops failed, the people were starving. What did the United States do? What every good capitalist country does. They fed the murderers. They sold them wheat. Guess what God the Father did? He sent drought to the United States. It was called the Dust Bowl. I believe it was in the 30s. We had crop failures. The breadbasket of America was bare. You think God was pleased that we were feeding the murderers who had slaughtered his children? I think not. He asked amiss. The communists weren't asking Christ for their daily bread. No, they asked for the United States. So what has this got to do with um, Pearl Harbor? Well, let's do a little background on Pearl Harbor. You know, today is December 6th. Tomorrow's December 7th. I wanted to do something about Pearl Harbor. Well, Japan wasn't trying to be an isolationist country. They didn't want foreigners in their land. Can't really say I blame them. Um, you know, the Israelis don't want Arabs in their land. But, you know, the Jews, the Zionists, they don't want, they don't want uh, the Africans or... Arabs in their, where they live, but yet if you live in the United States and you don't want those same people in your country, well, then you're a xenophobic racist, right? Well, Japan, do you know that Japan will not allow any mosque, no Muslim mosques? They're not allowed in Japan. They're banned. They don't want them. You could be a Buddhist, no problem. All right, but Japan wanted to be an isolationist country. They didn't want foreign ideas coming and upsetting the apple cart. And 
prior to the time of the American Civil War, you know, about the 1860s, Japan was ruled by a bunch of different samurai warriors. They were a divided country, you know, you might control this, the north section, somebody else controls the south section. But around the time of the American Civil War, we were starting to have ironclad ships. We went from wooden to ironclad ships. And there was a guy named Admiral Perry. He sailed from the United States to Japan. And that was a long trip in them days. But uh, I believe he had steam engined sailing ships. So they pull into the Japanese harbor and, you know, the United States has got cannons on their ship. Gatling guns, you know, the first, basically the first machine gun. And the Japanese were running around with steel swords, spears, and wooden bamboo armor on their bodies. So they were like really glad that Admiral Perry came seeking to open up trade and not as a conqueror because they knew they would not, you know, what are you going to do with swords against Gatling guns? And those of you that watched, uh, what was his name, Tom Cruise in The, the Last Samurai or whatever, uh, you know, Gatling guns, machine guns against swords and samurai on horses, that just doesn't work. Okay, so they wanted to open up trade with Japan because Germany, Russia, England, France, the United States, we were all carving up China. And sometimes if your ship had a problem, well, they wanted to be able to land in the port of Japan and be able to get some supplies or, you know, repair the ship or whatever they had to do. You know, they wanted a safe place to be. So Japan basically unified their, their government under an emperor. And they put down the last samurai's revolts. There was one in the south. So basically, Japan started to industrialize and modernize. I mean, they were basically a feudal, backward country. Well, what happened? I believe it was in the 1890s, the English, England, okay, largest navy in the world. England had the largest navy in the world. They were an island nation. It makes only sense for them to have the largest nation in the world. So what does England do? They don't want to pay their people a, a, a decent wage to build their ships. So they moved a bunch of shipmaking equipment to Japan in the 1890s. There was a British naval engineer. Matter of fact, let me look up his name. There was a French naval engineer, Leonce Verney, and a British naval mission headed by a guy named Captain Tracy. And they went to Japan and they helped organize the Japanese modern navy. If you want, you can get the book Japan and Britain After 1859, Creating Cultural Bridges by Olive Checkland. Uh, let's see. It is page... Hold on. Page 177. It says, The leading British shipbuilders involved in Japan, including the Thames Ironworks Shipbuilding and Engineering Company. Uh, let's see. Thomas Wilson and uh, quite a few others. Let's see. And then Admiral Archibald Douglas had been involved with building up the Japanese Navy in Japan. So here it is. Japan was a basically a third world country. And the British in the 1880s, 1890s, had shown Japan how to modernize and build 
steel ships and guns and what have you. They didn't have any cannons. Well, flash to forward to 1905. Japan had a war with Russia. They did a sneak attack on the Russian port called Port Arthur. It was basically a port in China. No, there were no airplanes used because there wasn't any airplanes in 1905. But what they did was they took their navy and snuck into the port and opened fire. Now, I don't know if you understand this, but steamships, to get a steamship going, and that's what they were back then. You'd have to build a fire with coal underneath the boiler. Well, you know, it, it takes, in a big ship like that, it would take, 30 minutes to get the boilers running to be able to get your ships to move. So basically the Japanese ships were moving, the Russian ships were dead in the water, and they just destroyed the whole fleet. Sneak attack. No declaration of war. Nothing. Well, then the Russians took their, that their Pacific fleet was wiped out. So then they sent their Atlantic fleet to fight Japan. Well, then they got beat again. So Japan had basically, in 1905, defeated the entire Russian fleet So from a sneak attack. Port Arthur. You think the United States would have known something? Well, no. Don't learn from history, right? So Japan modernized her fleet, and at the beginning of World War II, Two. During World War II, Japan had the third largest fleet of ships in the world. England had the largest fleet in the world. United States had the second. Japan had the third. After Pearl Harbor, Japan was number two. All our ships, capital ships, the large battleships, were sunk or damaged in Pearl Harbor. We had three aircraft carriers. They were out to sea. They were the mostly the modern ships. The submarines were a force to be reckoned with, but they had torpedoes that were either would run too deep and go underneath the ship, failing to explode, or if they did hit the ship, they didn't explode. So the submarine fleet, although it was untouched, had basically kept us in the war in the beginning, but um, they were having major problems with the torpedoes. A couple days later, after Pearl Harbor, where over 2,000 some odd soldiers and sailors died, and believe me, the um, Hilo is the third largest island in the uh, Hawaiian island chain. It's a series of islands. Hilo's the third largest island in the chain. And that newspaper you're looking at, the Hilo Island newspaper knew that there was an attack coming. But the United States military didn't, really. But a few days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Philippines fleet was attacked. General MacArthur, who I have respect for, but even though he knew the, the Japanese were coming, uh, the Japanese planes were just so good that uh, his stuff was just basically wiped out, and his fleet, his fleet was wiped out, except for the subs. My father knew an admiral of the Navy who was a sub-commander, retired. This was back in the 60s. He was in Manila Bay, Philippines. And basically he took a sub, went to the middle of the harbor, and basically, well, he didn't sink it, but he, he dived. And he sat on the bottom of the bay until the um, a nighttime came when the attack was over. Then he surfaced, and then he left the harbor, and he went to, I think he went to Australia. But that's how he was able to save his sub. 
And uh, he had been promoted to admiral. Oh, boy, I'm trying to think of his name. I can't think of his name. But uh, so basically, it was the British that gave Japan the technology, the machinery, to build the ships and planes that destroyed our ships at Pearl Harbor in World War II. Isn't that wonderful? Matter of fact, we were selling the Japanese steel and iron to build the ships and oil. We sold them oil. And you know, the reason we cut off, we, we placed an embargo against Japan on oil. They had, Japan had no, um, basically, Japan's got very few natural resources. They have no oil. The Japanese fleet had two months worth of oil to power their ships. When the oil embargo came, the United States must have known that they were going to have to attack and capture the oil fields like they did in the Dutch East Indies. You know, they must have known. I mean, Japan had basically no choice but to, to declare war. The Hilo Island newspaper, they knew that the attack was coming. How come the military didn't know? So basically, Japan had the second largest fleet in the world. Our fleet was destroyed. Our people were killed. And the United States had broken the naval and diplomatic codes, although they'll lie and tell you, well, we didn't really know. How come a, a newspaper knew the attack was coming and the military didn't? You see, people in the United States wanted war because they had a lot of money invested in war industry. You know, so the British uh, taught the Japanese how to make ships, but the Japanese were making ships for England. You see, they didn't want to pay their own, English didn't want to pay their own people a living wage. So they went to Japan where they could pay them slave labor rates. You see, free trade existed back then. So basically, England gave them the technology and the machinery. The United States sold them steel and oil, and they basically used all this to attack us. Uh, isn't that wonderful? So, basically, there was a lot of wealthy people involved in the defense industries. We knew the attack was coming, but they wanted they wanted war. There was a guy named by the name of uh, Prescott Bush. Perhaps you've heard of him. He was a senator from Connecticut. He was in charge of all the war industry stuff. If you, let's say you were Ford Motor Company and you wanted to make a Jeep or if you wanted to build a tank, you had to go to Prescott Bush and have him sign a paper authorizing you to purchase steel to build a tank or a car or a Jeep. Yes, Prescott Bush. He was George Sr.'s father. And he was heavily into the defense industries. Isn't it a coincidence that George Bush ended up being, what, CIA and president and all these wars, weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. You know, the thing is, if Saddam Hussein had poison gas, it's because, uh, well, Saddam had poisoned gas that he was using, Iraq was using against the Iranians, but it was the United States. We sold it to them. We sold him the poison gas. He didn't make it himself. You know, 
we uh we we made uh there were some people that got very 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 wealthy uh over world war ii building ships and planes of course the government was borrowing money that didn't exist how do you borrow money that doesn't exist you know the national debt there's not enough money in circulation to pay the national debt we're, how can we owe more money than money exists? You see, people, wars come because people lust or desire other people's things. And they will kill to take other people's things instead of getting on their hands and knees and, and asking the Lord for the things that they need. Or if they do ask for things, they don't ask for things they need, things they, they want. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? So said Janis Joplin. Do you really need a, 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 a Mercedes Benz? Really? So, you know, this is why we have war. But there is a time coming of peace. Here's an interesting verse. Matthew 10, verse 27. We'll start there. Jesus speaking. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So, it's funny that um, you get a lot of people like the Christ of Delphians and the Jehovah's Witnesses that says that there's no hell. But Jesus spoke about it. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. In other words, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without the notice of the father, trust me. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever shall therefore Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Hmm. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. In John 16 and verse 33, Jesus speaking, These things I have spoken unto you, that in, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. That's trouble. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And uh, this is for all those satanic Paul haters. Romans 16 and verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. 
And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And people will tell you that Paul is a false apostle. Oh boy. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, we read, And there was war in heaven. It's not just on earth. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That's you and me, buddy. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. How come the Yeshua crowd doesn't call him the Word of God? That's his name. Or how about Emmanuel, which means God with us? And his name is called the Word of God, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So there's going to be a big war. There was a war in heaven. Satan was cast out. Then there's going to be the Lord coming in the clouds of glory with his armies. And there he's going to smite the armies. But eventually, at the end of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, there's going to be another war. But after that's over, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 appears. This is eternity, people. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Does that mean that the old Jerusalem, present-day Jerusalem, is not holy? And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. But he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And that shall be the final say of things one day. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this Bible study. I thought it would be appropriate on Pearl Harbor Day. Um, you know, I served in the Army. I didn't do anything spectacular, believe me. All I did was uh, drink beer and a few other things I'm not too proud of. But um, to all the, you know, all the World War II vets... They're dying in droves. And I recently lost my father. He uh, was a World War II combat vet. And uh, I'll tell you what, I have a uh, reverence almost for those that served. They have a saying, some, sir, some gave all and some, all gave some and some gave all. It's just a shame that the military are pawns to be sacrificed by the wicked that are in power. But one day, when Christ comes to return and claim his kingdom, they will be crushed under his foot, our foot. I would like to read one more verse and then close this out. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. This is a Bible verse that you'll never, almost never, read or heard in a church today. Just remember that he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. All right, let's take a look. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to them, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, 
And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen.